gosh, I am so frustrated. Like, yeah, I'm just frustrated with our boss because I, I feel like I have these really good ideas. And anytime I brought them up to him, he just doesn't listen to me or he's just completely unresponsive to what I have to say. He doesn't ever give me good feedback. And I just don't really know what to do. I have a meeting with him in like five minutes and I don't know. I just feel like he's not going to listen to me. He's going to shoot my ideas down. And, you know, I, I've never spent any time with him outside of work and I don't really know him on a personal level, but I just kind of feel like he's a prick, you know? I just, uh, I, oh, hi. Hey, Jamie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, so... You know, I, I really wanted to talk to you about this idea that I had to mm -hmm. help productivity. Um, I was going over some reports, and uh, I kind of wanted to show you. I made some forecasts for the money that we could save. And mm -hmm. um, there's hey, a, Joe, um, can you get me some coffee real quick? Go ahead. Um, so we, there's a lot of missed opportunity with our shipping costs. I know that we're currently using UPS, and I actually ran some numbers um, with – with FedEx actually, mm -hmm. and I, they would they would save us a ton of money, and uh, if you maybe wanted to take a look at the reports that I did, uh, why do you why do you want to switch to FedEx? Um, so yeah, to to help create uh, more profit for the company and to oh. in increase productivity mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, I don't I don't know I don't like FedEx. I've always been a big fan of just UPS. Maybe if you looked at the reports, though, you could become a little bit more of a fan and see my. Yeah, you know, this week's really busy, but uh, go ahead and throw it on my desk, and let us I'll see if I can take a look at it later. All right, everybody, let's get this meeting going. All right, so that meeting didn't go very well, did it? No, it did not. No. So that's a common problem in today's uh, society. There's a lot of structure and a lot of uh, leadership, and then there's the subordinates, and there's a very rigid divide. So Jamie and I want to discuss an idea to you about humble inquiry. Um, yeah, so exactly. Uh, so humble inquiry, it's it's really rooted in the fundamental ability of how and when to ask a question. So the importance of asking questions to actually ask rather than asking leading questions to hear an answer that we want to hear. So fishing for an answer, that's really an important part of humble inquiry. So this is so important because the world that we live in is complex. It's culturally diverse and it's interdependent. And we're really unable to build the relationships with people that we need when we don't understand them. And in order to understand people in that genuine way that we need, we must ask them the right questions. So Ryan's gonna tell you a little bit about why humble inquiry is important in American society. So in today's culture, there's this rigid hierarchy. And within American organizations, whether it be a hospital in the medical field, business, corporate business, or even in our personal lives, the leaders are supposed to know all the answers and the subordinates are expected to just follow direction. Um, this creates that rigid divide and subordinates don't feel comfortable speaking to their superiors. Um, they may even be scared to bring new ideas to the table because they're afraid of being shot down like I did to Jamie. Um, in an American culture, we hold the idea of task accomplishment much higher than building relationships. So Jamie, how do we approach this issue? Well, that's a really great question, Ryan, and let me explain a little bit further. So uh, Humble Inquiry, it really focuses on building relationships more than just task accomplishment. And it does this through building a relationship based on a genuine curiosity, a genuine interest, and trusting the other person in a very genuine way. So it's essential that we become better at asking and do less telling in a culture that honestly overvalues telling. So a fundamental aspect to understanding humble inquiry is understanding the difference between humility and humiliation, because there is a huge difference. So humility refers to granting someone else a higher esteem than one claims for oneself. So you're giving someone a title that's greater than your own in this instance. Now with humiliation, that means to be publicly deprived of one's claimed status, which means to lose face. So on one end with humility, you're actually giving someone the gift of a higher status than yours and in humiliation, you're getting something taken away from you. So one's very positive and one's very negative. So Ryan's gonna talk to you about the three main types of humility that are relevant to the art of humble inquiry. Yeah, so the first is basic humility. Uh, this is 
mainly in like traditional society. So England, for example, Prince William was born to the royal family, therefore he's royal and he has that status. This isn't a choice, this status is given. It's a, um, it's a position that's uh, begin, a, begin a birth, rather. Um, and this doesn't mean that we can't respect one another, and it definitely means we should act with some measure of civility. Uh, the second option in, is called optional humility, and this is in societies where the status is achieved. So this is like a CEO that works his way to the top, a neurosurgeon who's now the head of, uh, head of his department. Um, and we can view these people in two ways. We can either admire them or envy them. And it's considered optional because we choose how we feel about them and whether or not we hang surround ourselves with them. Um, we can avoid these feelings by not, not being around them. Um, and, and this is largely affected by social media nowadays. Status is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the final type of humility is here and now humility. And this is the basis of humble inquiry. It's how you feel when you're dependent on another person. So, for example, Jamie has a higher status than I do, but I have the power to help or hinder her in her achievement of her goals. She has to be humble because she has to temporarily depend on me, uh, who may know something extremely important to, and relevant to the accomplishment of her task. So, unfortunately, people would often rather fail than admit their dependence on somebody. And that goes back to the leaders knowing all thing we talked about earlier. Uh, it's critical for bosses to realize they're independent or excuse me, indeed dependent on their subordinates and uh, their tasks complete are not necessarily assumed that they'll get done by the subordinates, but just that they, uh, that they need to be persistent and uh, inquisitive. Um, to, so to store, sort of put this in a nutshell, all members of the seesaw of work, regardless of your status, must recognize their dependence on one another. Exactly. So really the main point Ryan and I are stressing is the fact that we are all completely interdependent on each other to accomplish tasks in the work environment. And to really do that effectively, we can only do that through the art of humble inquiry. So asking the right questions and building those genuine bonds between colleagues, regardless of superiority and status. So let me give you an example from my personal life. So at work, I was giving a presentation with my assistant and I told her, I didn't ask, I told, I just told her that I preferred to stand to the right side of the room, which was nearest to the window. Now, I failed to ask her preference, not thinking it really mattered too much. Mm -hmm. However, after the presentation didn't go very smoothly, I actually learned that she needed to stand closest to the window because she gets anxiety and during presentations. And being near the window, it really helped to ease that anxiety. So now, some people might think, well, shouldn't the subordinate have mentioned her anxiety? And the answer is it's really no, because we live in a culture of a strict hierarchy where subordinates feel completely out of line disagreeing with their direct supervisor. Now, taking this relatively harmless example, Ryan's actually going to compare it to an emergency situation where a person's life could be at stake that's relevant to his personal work life. So I work for a local paramedics as an EMT. On an ambulance, I'm not the highest qualified medical provider. That's going to be the paramedic. That doesn't mean we work as a team but nonetheless, the paramedic has the final say. So let's say we respond to a call for someone having a heart attack. It's a pretty critical call, and it requires a lot of action to happen pretty quickly and orderly. Um, now, let's say hypothetically, my partner wants me to grab a specific medication. Now, maybe I've learned something about that medication that, or had a previous encounter with it where I just don't think it's the best option. I am just an EMT, I'm not the paramedic, and I don't know all the ins and outs of every medication. Nonetheless, maybe my partner is distracted by the multiple other tasks he has to complete and just simply said the wrong medication. But the trick is, how do I approach the medic and say, I don't think this is the best idea without being the guy that sounds like a know-it-all? I mean, this could be a serious problem, and I just don't want to be that guy. Now, if this particular partner and I have met outside of work, maybe we feel more comfortable um, asking questions about uh, procedures or medications. Or maybe the medic and I had a conversation at the beginning of the shift where he, if he said, if I see something, I need to bring it up. Now, this, is, this example is extremely hypothetical, and I have the fortune of working with some really smart and competent paramedics. Uh, but nonetheless, this is key to humble inquiry. The leader, in this case the paramedic, has to humble himself to ask me and acknowledge he may not know all the answers. Um, so how do we do that, Jamie? How do we ask the right questions and create an environment where everyone can feel they can provide input without harsh criticism. 
Well, that's an excellent example, Ryan, and I'm glad to elaborate on how we can do just that. So the primary component of building these professional relationships is to make them more personal and to create a feeling of safety between leaders and subordinates. So the keys to creating this type of relationship is first, it needs to be done in the proper environment. So the goal is to take the group away from work. So this could be as simple as going out to dinner or meeting for a game of bowling. Just getting out of that normal, redundant setting at work and getting people out to have a little fun together and loosen up. So the next is going to become genuinely interested in that person. And it's very important to be genuinely interested. So the leader could start by hypothetically lowering their status and bringing themselves down to a level that's off of their normal boss platform. And they could say something about themselves that gives the others an idea of who they are outside of work. So they could say that they like to play softball or go hiking or whatever the case may be. And this will open up a conversation to the others to become more open with them. Because oftentimes we feel a little closed off with our bosses. We don't really feel it necessary to open up with them. But if they open up that door, it becomes easier for us to do the same. So questions can become gradually more personal. And by the end of this interaction, the group feels that they have a better idea about each other. Now, this requires active listening and committing to open communication. And that's a very important part of this. So remember... We're all interdependent on each other for task completion, and we all need each other's cooperation to work together cohesively. This cooperation is achieved through asking the right questions when establishing a foundation for work relationships. And to do that, we must ask questions that are rooted in a genuine curiosity. We must listen actively, and we must build some type of rapport with our colleagues, regardless of their status, prior to working together on a task. Now, this will create an environment where people, regardless of status, feel safe to speak their minds and remain open to feedback. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just the art of asking the right questions, mm -hmm. when to ask them, and really creating an environment where uh, it's not a tell-all environment, that there is some give and take between um, subordinates and, and the leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Essentially, taking away that status of boss and subordinate and really everyone becoming on the become on the same playing field to bounce ideas back and forth, give mm -hmm. feedback, give criticism, and just create an environment that's a lot more productive and a lot more effective. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope you enjoyed our talk about humble inquiry and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.